All right, welcome back. Welcome back. Quiet today. Is your first? Quiet. Uh, I need to make a correction. So I messed up last time. Um, I got the facts of the Cosby case wrong. I did. And I apologize for that. I don't like getting stuff wrong, and I apologize. Um, the facts were like this. A woman accused Bill Cosby of raping her 40 years ago. In response, Cosby's lawyer leaked a letter that was defamatory of her. In other words, Cosby defamed the accuser. She then sued Cosby for defamation. The court dismissed the suit because even though she wasn't famous, she thrust herself into the forefront of a public controversy. Therefore, she was deemed a public figure, a limited purpose public figure, and she had to show that Cosby acted with actual malice, which she would not be able to show. So I remember we were talking, I was talking about the victim. I had it in my head and I just I flipped it. I don't know why. So I, you were actually asking me about that, so I apologize. So it was actually the suit was against the victim and not Cosby himself. So this is an instance where a person um, thrusted herself apparently into the public eye by making this accusation against Cosby. And by virtue of doing so, she became a limited public figure and it became harder for her to bring a defamation claim as a result. So the optics are all the place. Basically, Justice Thomas is writing an opinion to make it easier to sue Bill Cosby for sexual assault. I mean, just, you, can, you can write a thesis about that one. Uh, but but it's, it, 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 it's, it's the exact opposite way I said class, so I apologize for that. It's okay. Okay. I, I, <laughs> no, I try to get stuff right. I don't like when I get stuff wrong. It makes me very upset. Um, I, I try very hard, and I screwed that one up, so I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, what? Do you want to not touch on that, or can we ask questions? Of course, yeah, whatever you want. I was just curious, because Justice Thomas didn't really touch on why the lower court determined that just making that accusation would, would thrust yourself into the public forum. Uh -huh. And I didn't know if you kind of had any insight on that. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I don't think Justice Thomas was particularly concerned with whether, in fact, this was a correct application of precedent. I think his broader point was the precedent's wrong. In other words, if any facts could lead to the situation where, I mean, think about it. A woman accused a major celebrity of rape. And by virtue of making that accusation, she renders herself a public figure. Cosby then lied about her, but she can't sue unless she shows actual malice. Right, just, just think about the facts for a minute, totally independent of the case law. That circumstance is so far divorced from New York Times versus Sullivan, where you had these supporters of MLK criticizing a sheriff who was enforcing Jim Crow. Right, just, just think of the gap from MLK supporters criticizing Jim Crow to this woman unable to sue the man who she claimed raped her. Right, it's just a huge gap. And I think what Thomas is saying is two things. First. We should not be so quick to extend the Sullivan case to these limited public figure cases. But I think his opinion goes beyond that. I think he says Sullivan itself should go as well. So I think you can have a halfway point, right? You can say Sullivan's fine for government officials, but this idea for thrusting yourself in the limelight, you know, that, that, that is tough. And this is exactly what the Covington, Kentucky boys would have to deal with. They'll say that by virtue of engaging this high-profile confrontation on the mall in, in the Lincoln Memorial, they've made themselves public figures, and that's probably what the newspaper is going to argue. Um, the New York Times did post an apology over the weekend, behind the paywall, of course. Right? But they did post, <laughs> democracy dies in darkness, as they say, but they posted an apology over the weekend. Not quite an apology, but like a correction, an amendment. You can, you can read it for yourself. I, I don't think it... Um, I don't think it will make a difference. I think the lawsuit will proceed, but they at least acknowledge that their initial reporting was inaccurate. And very often posting a retraction is an important first step at, at avoiding liability for defamation or libel. I think that's a good point, yeah. I, th I think at a minimum it reduces their hook for damages, maybe for punitives. Uh, but they're still, I think they're still gonna argue that the boys became limited public figures in the same way that the, the Cosby accuser was. Yeah, yeah John and Evan? 
but it was their defamatory action that made them. So it yeah. wasn't like protecting them. It's like, hey, go ahead and say whatever you want because now you're famous, so you're screwed. I mean, it, it, it's kind of perverse, right? Because by virtue of writing the false story, that's what makes them public figures. Exactly. They, they it's didn't not, thrust it, themselves in that. But, it, but the, the precedent that the Cosby case relied on, it's not always volitional. Well, Cosby, yes. The Covington kids, no. They yeah. were literally just there. And I think they were minors, and I don't think they should be. That's an important factor also, which I don't think is in play. Usually, minors aren't able to make these sorts of decisions. These kids were high schoolers. Yeah. yeah. Didn't the school also suffer a whole lot of defamatory? Like, they had to even initial apology, and they didn't do anything. Yeah, yeah. And I, yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah, Evan. No, I was just kind of basically saying the same thing as him is here it wasn't voluntary. They, it was the newspaper and the media who, put, who made them. The yeah, public. it made, made them public, exactly. So, I, I mean, look, if, here's the thing about Justice Thomas, right? He flagged an issue which no one was talking about. Now you have this case which implicates a similar issue. It's possible the court might pare back the limited purpose public figure when it's non-volitional. I mean, I, I can see the Supreme Court maybe paring back this doctrine. Nathan, then John? So, playing devil's advocate here. Of course. Uh, could, uh, do you think an argument by the newspapers that they thrust themselves into the public life because they were there for a national protest. That's 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 the point I made to wit, right? They were they were in Washington D.C. at the Lincoln Memorial wearing red hats on the day of the of you know this huge rally, right? That's that's really that's really weak sauce, right? That's that's, that's I mean going to your capital petition for was a pro pro life rally to petition for a cause like abortion, that really doesn't strike me as making yourself a public figure. If that's the case, then right. the limit is too broad. John. I don't think Thomas wants to overturn New York's solid. I think he just needs to update it because it was like 1964 and the whole media and communications have changed so differently that it's just no longer a good thing. So what, what would the update be? I don't know. Maybe they need to define different classes, different criteria, yeah. different kind of standards for yeah. tests. Yeah, I think if there's going to be an update, and this is my, my own personal ranting, it's how a person can be thrust into celebrity by a few retweets, right? If a few blue check marks decide that you're famous, you're now famous, especially if you're what, 16, 17 years old, I, I can see the court pairing back and saying that's not enough to make you a public figure, especially because it's non-volitional. It wasn't their choice. Right? They became worldwide famous before they even knew it. Right? Before they probably even got home, they were, they were, they were blowing up. There, there was a, one second, there was, a, there was a case a couple years ago, it was, it was um, sort of obscure, but this one woman was flying to Africa, I can't remember her name, and she made some comment about African AIDS. It was stupid. And she was flying in this like flight from New York to Africa. It was like an, a 15-hour flight. And like all these people were retweeting her and like attacking her as being racist. And this woman was in the air, had no idea. And like in the time it took her to fly this route, her basically entire life was destroyed. And she was not very important. She just made some dumb racist joke on Twitter. And by the time she landed, she basically had lost her job and like, all these things happened to her. And she had no idea. I, I can't remember her name. Like they were actually having these people at the airport waiting for her to land. And she was just going out on a safari or something. Anyway, I saw another hand somewhere. Yeah, 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 Kyle. There's a, a guy who gave one or two TED Talks about that, and he also wrote a book about that particular. Oh, the, the, the woman flying to Africa? Yeah. yeah. I can't remember her name. I don't remember her name either. Just if someone Google it, I just I can't remember her name. It, it was a hashtag like, waiting for her name to land. I can't remember what the hashtag was. And like, you know, remember? Justine Sacco. Justine Sacco, thank you very much, yeah. Exactly, and I, I remember watching this live. People were tracking her flight, and this woman had no Wi-Fi. She had no idea. So the point I'm trying to make is, you have no idea that you're becoming a public figure. It's completely outside your control. And let me tell you something. Had she tried to sue one of those tweeters for defamation under this Cosby precedent, I think she's a public figure. And she didn't even know about it. She had no idea that she became a public figure and all those defamatory statements about her I think we're not actionable unless you have actual malice. Gabe? Uh, it was a comment about her getting AIDS. What was it? Yeah. Like AIDS? Yeah, 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 that was a comment. It, it, was, a pre, it was a pretty terrible tweet. I think he said something about just getting I'm white at the end. Oh, that was it. It, it was, the, look, it was. That was the butt of the joke. Ha ha, I'm white. So karma. Can't get AIDS. Can't get karma. <sighs> Whatever. You guys can judge the tweet. My only point is, could she have sued someone for defaming her? I think the answer is no. Probably not. I think she became a public figure, and she didn't even know it. She was in the air. She had no idea. 
Man, that's a flight not to have Wi-Fi on. Can you, can you imagine when she landed, her phone like probably literally exploded. Uh, I mean, just it, it probably actually blew up. Um, man. Uh, yeah, Andrew. I have actually have a, a question if you could expand on something a little different from this. Yeah. Um, you kind of talked about like the like the levels of free speech like students have in institutions, and obviously at a private institution we have less. But like in a public institution, I mean, it came to my attention that I guess public school students still don't have a right to free speech or something because made some declaration at CPAP this weekend that they're going to do an executive order to make sure that all schools receiving federal funding will like defend this right to free speech and I was kind of like well it's a public school don't they barred some you know I, would, well, I won't say crazy but like some you know uh, one, one extreme person going out yeah. and, and making that so yeah, let, let me answer your question in a broad way than in a, in a specific way. Um, I've gained a lot of sanity in my life by not taking seriously any presence as I see it in writing. Um, until I see an actual signed order, I'm just going to pretend it doesn't exist. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, that will make your lives a lot easier. Don't react to tweets. Do not yeah. react to actual actions by the government. And so then, that's my broad point. The more narrow point is there are actually already laws in the books which say that uh, schools that accept federal funding, which is basically all schools, must abide by the Constitution, which includes the First Amendment. Okay, that sounds nice, but that's pretty ambiguous, right? The rights of students are fairly opaque, right? What if there's protests, people disrupted on campus, right? Does that, does that violate the First Amendment? So again, I'm going to wait and see what, if anything, materializes, because half the stuff just never, go, never, never, never comes to anything. Yeah. Uh, 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 you know, some judge in Hawaii has already issued an injunction barring the order from being signed, I'm sure. But, you know, I, I, we'll, we'll see what happens. Mostly joking. Mostly joking. All right, what else? <laughs> you just an open forum? <laughs> oh, God, no. I'm teaching today. Let's go. Um, after class. Okay, so um, this is actually our last unit on the freedom of speech, if you can believe it. This is our class seven. And after this, we're moving on to the religion clauses, which are uh, a lot more divided. Yeah, the free speech cases, these are almost all like 9-0, 7-2, 8-1. These are all fairly um, unified cases. When we do the religion cases, it's all over the map. These are almost all going to be 5-4. So it's a, very, it's a very different world where we're living in. And the specific topic for today is what's called commercial speech. Now, how many, how many of you are in my con law class versus property? Okay, most of you. So I'm sure if you didn't have me for con law, you say the case of Lochner v. New York. Um, and you were probably told that this is the, the worst case in the history of the Supreme Court. It ranks next to Korematsu and Dred Scott and, um, you know, Plessy as, you know, the Annie Cannon, right, these, these, these terrible cases. And, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit more magnanimous about Lochner. I don't think it was correctly decided, but I think it was within the realm of possibility. I actually go with the Harlan dissent. But the reason why there's such a hostility towards Lochner um, arises out of the New Deal. That the Roosevelt administration was trying to promote progressive laws, and these pesky conservative federal judges were stopping progress from being made. So Lochner was largely vilified. And the outcome of this vilification became what's known as footnote four of Caroline Products. We keep coming back to it. Which explained that rights that are not enumerated in the Constitution uh, give, are given rational basis review, very deferential scrutiny. And then some years later, the court decided Williamson v. Lee Optical. This was a case about whether um, opticians, right, people who just fit lenses, can make copies of glasses. And the Supreme Court there said, uh, the state can ban it, right? Uh, uh, with economic regulations, that's for the democratic process. And so long as the um, government has some sort of conceivable basis why this rule is needed, they can enact it. So traditionally, economic regulations were reviewed really deferentially. And the court wasn't here to second guess it. You see that approach in Justice Rehnquist's dissent in the Virginia pharmacy case. He was very, very livid. He was, he was Lochner, 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 right? Uh, you know, Marsh, Marsh, he, he's, he's very up on Lochner. But what's the difference between an economic regulation of, say, hours 
how many hours you can work, or an economic regulation of prices, you know, how, many, how much can you charge a person per hour to work, versus an economic regulation of advertisements, right? Think about it. The government says you can only pay this worker no less than $5 an hour. That's fine, right? The court said that that's a valid regulation of the economy. The government says that you, you, you cannot publish how much you're paying this employee, or you cannot advertise how much you're paying her. Oh, no, that's not OK. Wait a minute. Why is there even a difference, right? And I think Justice Breyer's dissent in NIFLA, which I assign at the end, crystallizes this. His point is, what's the difference? Everything is speech. Everything we say is speech. All aspects of commerce are speech. If you're a business and you want to stop an economic regulation, all you got to do is frame the relevant activity as speech. And if you can frame the relevant activity as speech, instead of being in the rational basis land of the optical, my friend, you are now somewhere between intermediate and strict scrutiny, depending on how you frame it. And Breyer says if we start treating economic activity as if it were just mere speech, we go back to Lochner. Not such a bad thing, maybe. I don't know. But we go back to a different world. One other irony, and I'm going to move on from here. The first case, this Virginia State Board of Pharmacy, who was the one dissenting? It was Justice Rehnquist, who was the most conservative member of the court. Isn't that backwards, right? You have the most conservative member saying, no, let's not protect businesses. It's almost the exact opposite of what you expect today. And who brought this case? A guy named Alan Morrison, who was partners with Ralph Nader, if you, that name rings a bell. Right? These were cases brought by liberal groups, because liberals wanted more transparency in pricing. Right? They wanted to know how much poor senior citizens were paying for pharmaceuticals. But these doctrines are now being used by big, big corporations to fight against progressive legislation. So basically, everything's all over the frickin' place here, right? Just, this is a topsy-turvy, topsy-turvy topic. Ooh, that was good. This is a topsy-turvy topic that, that resists normal characterization. So we start with Virginia Pharmacy, then we go to the Central Hudson test, and they give you the, uh, the Lori Lar tobacco case, which gives you some applications of Central Hudson. And then we go to the um, more recent cases, like Mattel and Nifla, where it's the conservatives on the court who are wielding this sort of scrutiny to set aside economic regulations under the umbrella of speech. All right, I'll make one last point and I'll, and I'll start calling on people. I don't know what the vitality is of the commercial speech doctrine today. If you look at the, um, the NIFLA case, it doesn't even really mention the central Hudson factors. It just doesn't really care. And in Metal v. Tam, the court time just brushes it aside. So yeah, whatever, we apply it towards the end. Um, this is a doctrine, I think, on its last legs. I think, once again, Justice Thomas will prevail. He usually does in the long run. And I think at some point, the court will just, the court will just it's not get rid of commercial speech. Say, we're just not going to apply it anymore. Um, it, it should have been applied in Mattel much more strongly. And I think it should have been applied in the Nifla case. And it just didn't, didn't resonate. OK? All right, let's start. Who's next? All right, Costa, you want to give me the facts, please? And oh, I hate this name. I always say it wrong. Virginia State Board of Pharmacy versus Virginia Citizens Consumer Council. There it is. OK. It's a, it's a mouthful, right? Yeah. Can you give me the facts, Costa? Yeah, so it basically it arises out of a uh, Virginia statute that stated that uh, you can't publish unprofessional conduct of pharmacists to publish, advertise, or promote directly or indirectly in any manner whatsoever, any amount, price, fee, premium, discount, rebate, or credit terms for any drugs which may be dispensed okay. only by prescription. Okay, so Kasa, let me, this is not in the case, but I want to focus on this point, right? Why would the government prohibit pharmacists from publishing their prices? Just, yeah, it's not in the case, but I want you to think for a minute. <laughs> why, why, why would the government say you can't publish prices? Like if they said you have to publish your prices, I think we'd all get that's for disclosure, right? I think that would make sense. But this is the opposite. It's you can't publish your prices. Why would they tell a pharmacist this? <laughs> well, probably because they don't want 
You're the lawyer, right? You're the lawyer for Virginia. Defend this law. Why, why, why are you banning the publication of prices for pharmaceuticals? The, there's an answer. It's not a nice answer, but there's an answer. It prevents comparison shopping, right? If I'm a pharmacist and I want to gain a competitive advantage, I'm going to drop my prices and I'm going to advertise my reduced price. Say, look, you go to CVS, you pay $5. You come to my pharmacy, you get $3, right? Whatever it is. The real reason why this law exists is to basically prevent people from comparison shopping. There are lots of cases involving lawyers, states that restrict how much uh, lawyers can charge, states who say you can't publish prices for legal services. It's protectionism, right? You're making it harder to comparison shop. It prevents someone who wants to publish the prices from actually doing it. Now, Christine, uh, you're next? Or is it going to go that way? OK, so Lance, let me ask you this question. Sorry, you're off the hook, Christine, until later. Lance, let me ask you this question. Now, you're the lawyer for Virginia, right? Can you go to court and say, Your Honor, we have this law in the books to prevent comparison shopping. We want to make it hard for people to save money. You want to screw people over. Okay, can you just walk into court and say that? I mean, that's the real reason why, but can you just say that in court? Not. No, not a good idea. So then what, what answer do you give? Right? What's, the, what's the court reason, the, the, the justification you would give in court as to why this, this is the rule? What do you mean? Um, that's a good answer. I didn't think of that, but what do, you, what do you mean? I mean, that's what I got. I mean, I thought figured that's why they were banning prescription drugs as opposed to other things. So, so by publishing the prices, it may encourage people to use them? Is that the idea? Yeah. That's not actually, that's, that's not a bad idea. Um, well, let me, let me, Kate, let me ask you a related question, right? Generally, what happens when two businesses are competing on price? What often happens as a consequence of two businesses competing on price? I'm sorry? Okay, the one will lower the price, the next one lowers the price, then go back and forth, right? But at a certain point, we're dealing with drugs, right? Pharmaceutical products. Mm -hmm. what's, what's a pharmacist going to do to keep undercutting their competitor? What might they do? What might they be tempted to do? I mean, I guess you could, like, just say it. Cut corners. Yeah, 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 I think you're right. When you get into a price war, eventually you start cutting corners. Maybe you reduce your sanitation standards, right? Maybe you're not so careful with mixing the products. Maybe you hire uh, lower skilled workers to mix the, to compound the pharmaceuticals, right? You, you find ways to cut corners. Um, and the state says, we don't want that, right? We are so committed to having our pharmaceuticals at the highest level, we don't want to have a price war. And the way to avoid a price war is to ban the publication of prices. Ah, that's the answer you give in court, right? And this is what happened in a lot of lawyer cases. A lot of states make it, a, or, or at least made it a crime for a lawyer to publish his rates. Right? You say, we will give you $100 flat fee for an uncontested divorce or $200 flat fee for a will. Uh, states have said, you can't do that, right? We do not want lawyers competing on price because if lawyers compete on price, they're going to cut the quality of their representation and impact clients. Is that true? Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> well, well, I mean, let's look at it this way, right? If you walk into an AmLaw 100 law firm, they're going to bill you $1,000 an hour and give you one product. Not everyone can afford $1,000 an hour for a product. Maybe you want to walk to a solo practitioner, right, who will give you a flat fee of $100 an hour, whatever it is. So will, will price will reduce quality of legal services? It might. It might not. But the question isn't whether we can agree with the state. The question is, can the courts second guess the determination of the state to make that judgment, right? We can all say that that's a stupid policy or it's a smart policy. I don't really care what you think. It, doesn't matter. it really doesn't matter to me. But whether courts can then second guess the state's policy to prevent a price war. So again, so if you walk into court, you don't say, Your Honor, we have this law to prevent people from comparison shopping because so we want to screw the old people. No, no, you don't say. You say, Your Honor, we want to make sure everyone gets quality pharmaceuticals and we don't want to have a price war. 
that can result in the depreciation of quality of these drugs. Done. Right. This is not in the case, but that's what's going on in the background. Okay. All right. Anyway, so the Pharmaceutical Council, which is basically this liberal group, sues the state, saying, "Look, our members, we want to have access to prices. Why? So we can comparison shop. So we know if we're getting ripped off, right? So we know in advance how much something's going to cost, and we are our people who are elderly, who are sick, who are poor can get it. Again, this is in the '70s, right? This is this is a, this is a while ago. Pharmaceuticals were not nearly." as expensive as they are today. It was a very different world, but they wanted to have these prices. OK, so Harrison, the first question is, is, is the publication of a price the First Amendment? Um, not necessarily. It's not expressing an idea. OK. So I think we all agree that there's a difference between, I mean, not just as Thomas, but most people would agree there's a difference between saying vote for candidate X or support proposition Y and aspirin costs 25 cents a pill, right? I think we all, we'd all at least maybe agree on that much. There's also a difference between burning a flag in protest of the war or the draft and saying that, you know, some antibiotic will, will, will be $5 a bottle. Okay. But Harrison, the key point is, is still the provision of a price, staying a price, is that considered speech? Yes. OK. And that much the court says. The mere fact that the speech considers offering a product for a specific price, an advertisement, does not take it outside the orbit of the First Amendment. It's still within the scope of the First Amendment. And here, the court gives this new label, not a new label, but a, a label of commercial speech. And they'll define it both in this case and the next case. But they decide for commercial speech, it's different than political speech, but it's protected a little bit lesser. Right? The court says, speech does not lose First Amendment protections because money is spent. And here they say Buckley versus Vallejo. That was the campaign finance case you read a few weeks ago. And they also say speech is protected even if it involves solicitation of money. And they cite New York Times versus Sullivan. Remember, heed the rising voice, voices, right? And there's a little cutout in the corner. They want you to mail in money for MLK. So the mere fact that money is being spent and involves solicitations, they say, still makes it uh, protected. OK? Now, Carlo, why should the First Amendment protect sharing prices, right? What value does an advertisement of prices give to society, right? Why is this something that society ought to protect? Well, it benefits society as a whole because they're able to do their homework. Bingo. The court says that society has an interest in the free flow of commercial information, right? People benefit from more information, right? Prices, well, economics lecture, right? But on the free market, Prices are signals, right? Prices are important signals of information. If someone's charging a low price, that's probably a signal that's not so good. And if someone's charging maybe a higher price, you can be more confident. It's not always work that way. Yeah, Gabe. Yeah, I wasn't going to comment on that. Please. From the opinion, it said uh, the suppression of prescription prices information, it's the hardest part of the world in the procedure. Yeah. So it makes it like, you know, the people that don't have yeah, it's almost backwards what you think, right? Because the person who brought this lawsuit was not a pharmacy. Think about that for a minute, right? The pharmacies love this rule. The Virginia pharmacies love this rule because it lets them jack their prices up. Pharmacies are not going to complain. This is what's called protectionist legislation. Who complains? The customers. It's the customers complaining, the elderly, the sick, the age, right, that they're not getting the information they need to make their informed decisions. But this is back in the 70s. Now it's the opposite, right? Now it's corporations using this doctrine to chip away at economic regulations. It, it, it's, it's basically backwards what it, what it once was. All right? So the court says that advertising is important. All right, and Gabe, I think you're next. Gabe, does the court find then that this sort of regulation, this absolute ban, is permissible on prices? 
Does the court find that the ban on publishing prices is, is, uh, is permissible? Does the court uphold the Virginia law? No. No, no. no I'll come back to you, David. No. Yeah. Why does the court find that the Virginia law is unconstitutional? What, what about the Virginia law is problematic? That they're like completely suppressing the Yeah. Account. It's a complete ban. It's a complete ban. The court says that you might be able to regulate the time, place, and manner of speech. So imagine the government said that, you know, uh, if you publish, uh, 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 you, you can publish prices, you know, but you have to use a certain font size so it's legible, right? Okay. Or uh, you, you have to publish your prices, you know, it, you know once a quarter uh, so that people can research them in advance, right? Regulations of the manner and the time in which you make this information public is fine. But this is an outright ban, and it's not permissible. Therefore, they don't give a test. That comes in the next case. We'll do that in a few minutes. But in this case, at least, Virginia law is unconstitutional. So any questions in the majority in Virginia pharmacy? Gabe, I'll come back to you. Walk me through the Rehnquist dissent. He's, he's really mad here. He's hopping mad. I mean, right, right, this, this is also what, 70, what year, 76? Rehnquist was on the bench maybe one or two years. I think he saw it as mutton chops at this point. Um, yeah, he, he grew these mutton chops in the 70s. It's hilarious. Uh, you know. By the way, he, he, he had this one line about smoking and drinking and, and prescription drugs. The dude was a chain smoker, and he was hooked on prescription drugs. Uh, he had some sort of back procedure, and basically the doctor was giving him this, like, this heavy dosage of basically opiates, right? This really heavy dosage. And like... He had to basically, like, not quite rehab, but basically rehab, check himself in. He, he was totally addicted. So this, this is just a little, uh, a little bit of hindsight. But yeah, Gabe, just walk me through the Rehnquist, Rehnquist descent. Yeah, so he goes to believe the person in and then um, basically it will be an open door policy towards commercial advertising. Mm -hmm. uh, he also spoke to talk about the liquor, cigarettes, and all that we're saying. Yeah. Um, he said that the court has overruled legislative determination um, about advertisement and should not be allowed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for Rehnquist, this is basically Lochner, right? That the court should not be intervening and second guessing the judgment of the Virginia legislature. If they've decided that they want to preserve quality in pharmaceuticals by publishing, I'm sorry, by banning the prices, then that's their decision. The mere fact that you're shrouding your challenge in the First Amendment doesn't let you get around the 14th due process clause, although they're all due process clause cases anyway, right? That this is not a, a backdoor to going to Lochner. Okay. Yeah, so his discussion of drug abuse may have been a little bit autobiographical, but, uh, you know, I don't know. Yeah, he, he died of cancer. He was a chain smoker uh, until the very end. I, 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 someone told me that he basically disabled the smoke detectors in his chambers, and I, I can't vouch for that. But, you know, when you're the... When you're the chief justice, you get away with stuff. <laughs> yeah, cut, cut. Okay. So, I get that he doesn't want to promote uh, like widespread drug use, right? But he says that the rights of the appellees seem to be manifest and that they can publish the information if they want. But isn't this case about like them not being able to know the price of drugs? So why is he saying that they could even, that they can get it? Well, again, yeah, yeah. I think Kyle raises a fair point. The plaintiffs here are not the pharmaceuticals. I'm sorry, not the pharmacies. They're the customers. Right. The person in the position to put the information out is the pharmacy. Right. How is the customer supposed to gain this information? So really, this case isn't about the right of the publishers. It's the right of people to know, right? And, and let me just, I'll put this question back to Kyle. Can a customer have standing to challenge a law that regulates pharmacies? It depends if he's directly impacted, I believe. But I mean, ha, ha, it, the law doesn't regulate customers. It only regulates the pharmacies. I hadn't thought of that before until your question. But why would a customer have standing to challenge a law that restricts a, a regulated industry, pharmacies? Uh, just be, the customer would have to assert that they have the right to know the information. A right to know. My goodness. Yes. John? I think 
unintended beneficiaries of the, the uh, pharmacy that's trying to advertise to them? You know, I got to check the full case. If anyone wants to pull up the full case and look at the standing analysis, uh, please do so. I, I've never actually checked it. It didn't occur to me until Kyle's question, but it's a good question. Yeah, I, I, think, I think the two of you are on the right track. You have to say that they were the intended beneficiaries of this welfare law, and therefore they have, they have a standing to challenge a law that doesn't regulate them. I mean, this is just like the Obamacare case. Can a person who pays the mandate, does he have standing to challenge regulations to how hospitals provide services, right? It seems divorced, but standing was very um, fluid uh, back in the 70s. It wasn't, I mean, now it's not particularly rigid anyway, but it was, it was even more fluid than it is today. Those were, those were, those were heady days back then. Okay. All right. Uh, I think that's it. All right. So, any other questions on the Virginia pharmacy case? Okie doke. I'm not going to call on you two. Don't worry. Uh, we have two, two guests here today uh, visiting. Thank you. All right, Jesse, I think you're next then. Okay. So, let's go on to the next case uh, Central, Central uh, Hudson Gas and Electric Corp versus the Public Service Commission, 1980. So, this was a couple years after. By the way, yeah, so go ahead, just give me the facts in this case, please. Okay, so here we have um, an order to cease advertising that promotes electricity or the use of electricity. Okay, what was the time frame in which they couldn't print? 1973, so we, this is around the time of the fuel shortage? Yes, everyone, did everyone figure that out? It wasn't in the case, but it was sort of like lurking in the background. Okay, so let me just... For those of you who, who don't know the background, um, in most states, the energy industry is heavily regulated by, well, at least in cold in New York, the Public Service Commission. So if you want to sell energy in New York, you have to comply with a lot. These are common carriers, right? They, they can't deny you electricity if, you're, if you live in this block. So long as you're willing to pay the established rate, they will give you power, right? Um, in 1973, <clears throat> the Public Service Commission ordered the electrical utilities in New York to stop all advertising and promotes use of electricity. My God, how broad is that, right? They could not advertise their own product. Just think about that for a minute. You are a company that sells electricity, and you can't advertise the very thing that you're selling for the period of October of 73 to March of 74. All right, now why that period? That was the height of the so-called oil shortage, where OPEC, the oil-producing uh, countries, turned off the spigot. They, uh, in response to the Yom Kippur War, they basically stopped shipping oil to much of the Western world. Um, this was the oil embargo. And you had serious problems in the United States with gas shortages, right? People would be waiting online for hours for gasoline. Uh, and a number of states started doing rationing of gasoline that... If your license plate had an odd number, you go to the gas station one day. If your license plate ended in an even number, you go to a gas station a different day. You go to a vanity plate, I think it was something else. Um, you, people were stealing license plates. People were, I mean, just go to Wikipedia, this is legit. People were getting shot at gas stations. People were trying to siphon gas out of your pump. It was a, it was a disaster. Um, it, it was an absolute mess. Uh, we have enough reserves, say, to prevent this sort of petroleum shortage, but it was a huge deal. Okay, so Ruth. Why would the Public Service Commission say you can't advertise electricity in the winter? Right? What's, the, what's the reasoning behind this order from the commission? Mm -hmm. well, I imagine yeah, it's cold. How cold it is. Colder than this, but this is not cold, by the way. Mm -hmm. This is like, this is, this is not cold. It's not cold, my God. This is not. Thank, where are New York you from? Rochester, okay, you're near the Hudson Valley. Okay, very good. I'm used to this because it's cold. Oh, people in Jack, it's fine. Okay, yeah, but, but Ru 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 Ruth, Ruth is correct, right? The yeah, thinking is, well, we don't want people using too much power, so let's not advertise that you can use electricity. What the hell? Did, did anyone actually think this through? Like, did anyone actually think this through? If you're cold, you think, you know, I'm going to flip the switch by, there's no advertising, tell me what to do. How, what am I going to do? It's cold. You turn the damn heat on. I, so I, I, again, you don't need Herbert Spencer social stacks when this regulation's stupid, right? It, that, you don't need that. But that's not the question. Okay, so this is a bizarre order. 
Oh, by the way, the oil crisis was in 73. This case was decided in 1980. Seven years elapsed, which tells me there's some sort of disciplinary action where basically the, the commission tried to issue a fine or something to, to, this, to, this, to the energy company, and it was sitting around for like seven years. So I mean, this is, this is not quite urgent, but you know, I guess they got around to it eventually. OK. So in this case, the energy company challenged the order. It wasn't a customer saying, I want to know how much electricity is going to cost in my jurisdiction. It was the energy company itself that brought this lawsuit challenging uh, the, the, the commission's order. OK, so here we get the four-part test. It's called the Central Hudson test. Um, the first two factors are pretty easy to satisfy. Uh, the case will almost always turn on factors three and four. Um, so don't, don't kill yourself in the first two. I'll just read those for you. So the first question is, is the expression protected by the First Amendment? Well, duh. Right? If it's not we're, not, we're not in the First Amendment land. Right? If, if, the protect, if the expression is not protected by the First Amendment, none of this stuff matters. But the upshot is everything's protected by the First Amendment. So it's basically the first factor is, you know, I, I mean, not quite automatic, but, but more or less automatic. Um, the second factor asks, is the asserted governmental interest substantial? This actually has a little bit of teeth, but not that much. Uh, we talked about in con law different types of state interests, right? With strict scrutiny, the state interest must be compelling, right? With intermediate scrutiny, the state interest must be Important or substantial, yeah, exactly. They use different formulations. So this test is more or less approximating intermediate scrutiny. Not exactly, but it resembles it. It doesn't require a compelling interest. Instead, it requires an interest that is substantial. But I think in almost every case, the government say, oh, yeah, that's substantial, right? Saving fuel during the shortage, during the embargo, that, that's important. I think that, that's easy, OK. The third one is where I think a lot, of, a lot of the work gets done. So it says, we must determine whether the regulation directly advances the governmental interest asserted. Andrew, it directly advances the governmental interest as asserted. What, is, what, what does that mean? Um, so it's like, it's not. I mean, kind of what it's saying. Is it the <laughs> regulation or whatever they're trying to do, uh, a dr is its direct result going to be what they're looking to do? So with this, they Good. were looking to reduce advertisements to, re to hopefully reduce the load on the electrical grid. And if you reduce advertising, Good. supposedly people aren't going to use it. Yeah, so the third factor they find is actually satisfied, right? They say there's a direct link between the state's interest in saving energy and the order, right? If the state wants to save energy, they say you can't publish advertisements of, of power usage, right? This is not, this third factor is not like the narrow, I'm sorry, this fa the third factor is not the narrow tailing, it's actually the next one. This is simply saying, is there some sort of relationship, right? A link between what they're trying to accomplish, and what they accomplished. In other words, are the means connected to the ends, right? Does banning the publication of prices relate to um, saving energy? And that's an easy test to satisfy, I think, in most cases. So here they find the third factor satisfied, no problem. OK, everyone OK with that? So Alicia, I think, I think you're next. Give me the fourth factor of the Hudson test. Is What's the regulation not more extensive than necessary to serve that interest? OK. And this is the critical interest. Yeah. This is basically where the entire case turns, right? Everything turns to number four. Alicia, just walk me through. What does that actually test me, that fourth factor? Um, it requires, well, it tests you if there's a reasonable fit between the means and the ends of the regulatory scheme. And I know that I'm skipping ahead when I say that, but that, that was a good definition. And um, you must be careful. You must carefully calculate the cost and benefits associated. With the right. 
Yeah, so think of it this way, right? The third factor says, is there some sort of fit between the means and the end? Yes. The fourth factor is, but is that fit reasonable? So really, factors three and four are pretty, they overlap, don't they? I mean, there's a lot of overlap, I think, between three and four, which is why I hate these four factors tests, right? The first two factors always satisfied, and three and four are basically the same thing. So really, the entire thing is, does this pass intermediate scrutiny? Right? It's, it, 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 it boils down to, does this pass intermediate scrutiny, right? Is there a reasonable fit between what they're doing and what they're trying to accomplish? Right? And then, Carl, is there a reasonable fit in this case? Not in this case. No, sir. Why not? This is overbroad. Yes. Well, yeah. Any electricity, it's kind of yeah. There's not sufficient narrow tailoring, yeah. right? If you want to think of it in terms of that language, right? That what they're trying to do is save energy and they're using this holy cow broad ban of all possible advertisements, there's not an adequate fit between the means and the end. It's overbroad, way too broad. Okay? The court says the energy conservation rationale by itself cannot justify suppressing information about how to maybe save electricity or about how to use, I don't know, solar power. It didn't it even existed back then, but just other things that aren't using as much hydrocarbons. If President Carter, one of his first initiatives was to put solar panels in the roof, and then President Reagan took them off in a couple of years. That was, one, that was one of the first things he did. But yeah, I mean, uh, there's not an adequate fit between the means and the ends. So therefore, the New York uh, Public Service Commission, uh, the order itself was unconstitutional. All right, so any questions in the majority on Justice, uh, Justice Lewis Powell? He was uh, the same Justice Powell who wrote Bakke, the affirmative action case. I think it's the other case because you want to study it. Anything else from the majority? Uh, Dyer, I think, uh, yeah. Rehnquist is also very hopping mad here. He seems to be very, he, he has something in his craw about this. What, what's Rehnquist talking about here? Rehnquist basically thinks that economic speech should not yeah. First Amendment protection is given to political speech. Exactly. There be deference to the, legislation, the state legislators or yeah. regulators in this case, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Rehnquist again says Lochner, 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 Lochner. This, this is, an, is an economic regulation and it should get complete deference. Um, he says the court has unlocked the Pandora's box by elevating commercial speech to the level of traditional political speech. And, you go ahead, Dyer. You see they had opened the Pandora's box in the previous case, and this, now they're reaping what they I think so, yeah. yeah. And, and let me just, Justice Breyer makes this point a little more bluntly. If the court starts expanding of all the things that are protected by the First Amendment, that has the effect of watering down First Amendment scrutiny. And Breyer is worried about if we give too much protection to commercial speech, it's going to water down their scrutiny for political speech. So Justice Breyer would just segregate them and have strict scrutiny for political speech and just basically rational review for commercial. You're to use yeah, yeah, I'm jumping out to NIFLA. I, I think Breyer, NIFLA, and Rehnquist in the uh, New York Hudson case are very much in the same, using the same vocabulary. They both scream out Locke every three seconds. You know, you, you know Godwin's law, right? Any argument on the internet will reduce to Hitler in that three minutes, right? <laughs> it's true, Godwin's law. I, I think I, I don't know if I coined it, but I think I made it famous, Lochner's law, right? Any argument will reduce to Lochner in about five minutes with Justice Breyer. He, he, he can't, he's obsessed with it. He's, you know, Sorel v. IMS Health and NIFLA, he just, he, he I, think, I think Lochner's baker, he keeps him up at night. I think he worries about it very profoundly. Must have had a bad case of, you know, food poisoning from there or something, I don't know. All right. All right, any other questions then on, uh, on, the, on the New York case? Yeah, McKinney? Oh, no questions, sorry. Are any other cases on the Hudson case? The court the central Hudson case, uh, shall we say, inconsistently. And sometimes they apply it, like in the Lori Lard case, and sometimes just don't even mention it, like in NIFLA. Okay, anything else? Yeah, Carla. Yeah. That's what I figured. Yeah, there's generally a freedom to receive information. So I guess they argue that 
by restricting the pharmacist from publishing information, they were denied information. That, that makes sense. Thank you for checking. It's always helpful when people do that. And by the way, Alan Morrison, he, uh, he's a professor at GW. He's actually a very good lawyer. He's a friend of mine. I, I very much like him. Uh, but he, he, he's about as progressive as they come, but the cases he argued in the 70s have basically given rise to this huge commercial speech doctrine. Uh, not, not, not his original intent, as they say. Things have unintended consequences when you make arguments in the Supreme Court. All right, anything else on... Um... Yeah, yeah, Dyer. In this case, with, with, or I'm not exactly familiar with the um, uh, uh, regulations on electric providers in, mm -hmm. in, in, at the time in, in uh, New York, but weren't they heavily, they were very heavily regulated. So why wasn't this more of a license to use the public uh, utility grid, kind of the way they issued licenses for public broadcasting mm -hmm. of television? Well, that's what they argue. So think about it this way, right? The government passes a law and they say, power company, you can only charge, you know, five cents per kilowatt hour. Yeah. Fine. They say, you can't advertise what you're charging. That's not okay. So it's almost strange, right? They can regulate the price that they're charging, but they can't ban them from publishing their price. It's almost backwards, right? This, this I think, is why Breyer gets so agitated. Depending how you frame the challenge, it's either a 14th Amendment substantive due process case, which is basically a rational basis review, or it's an intermediate scrutiny central Hudson case, depending how you frame the, the regulation. Right. You can tell them to do whatever they want, but you can't tell them what to say. Yeah, David. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you're going to turn the heat on. You're yes. Heat on, so. Yeah. Well, you know, people who are, sh I mean, it's it's not trivial. If if you if you if you don't have money, you may not turn the heat on, right? I mean, may, maybe at the margin there is someone who says, well, maybe power is too expensive. I'm going to turn it off. I mean, it, it's possible. Carlo. Well, I kind of think about like, I don't know how competitive they were. Uh, in New York at this time, but like here in Houston, you drive around and you see there was no the competition. There, you had one; it was monopoly in each in each geographic area. There was one provider who had a monopoly. It was public. It was a public provider. Yeah, I mean the the, the Houston market. I mean, my God, it's like thirty different companies that sell electricity. And they're, they're all basically the same source, right? It's just they right. just package a little bit differently. That's all, all after yeah, yeah, it's all fairly new. But in New York, you had. You know, I, I, I had Con Ed, that was a power company, Con Edison, right? They were the, remember about a month ago, there was a power plant in New York, there's a blue, green light in the sky. I mean, that's Con Ed, that's, that's who did power. Yeah, Golda? Um, how did the Central Hudson case control the third, um, the third, I guess, question that the government's interest, but it seems to be a very convoluted way to get to the answer. And I think you made a good point. The phrase directly there bleeds into the next one, right? So let's go back to the third factor, right? The court says, uh, the court says there is an immediate connection between advertising and demand for electricity. Is immediate connection the same as directly advancing? I think, if you think of these words, right? Direct, directly advancing and immediate, I think directly is much tougher. If you think of, you know, thinking torts, right, proximate cause versus like the direct cause, right? I think of uh, immediate connections like, you know, proximate maybe, right? But the direct cause is this was the, 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 the primary mover. So I think, I think Golda, your points is, is Golda, Golda? Thank you. I, th I think your point's well taken, right? That it's not even clear if the third factor is satisfied here because there's such a, um, bizarre gap between regulating the price and reducing grid usage, right? There's a huge attenuation there, I think. Good point. How, how direct would the, I guess, correlation have to be? This seems to be, they, they stop advertising. People might lower their electricity use, but not necessarily. It might be as a result of other factors. 
And then wouldn't the direct use just be that you can't use electricity between the hours of, let's say, 5 a.m. and 6 p.m.? Yeah, I think this is a question of how tight the fit has to be, right? Um, with intermediate scrutiny, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it's got to be close enough. Um, here they find, again, the third factor satisfied, but yeah, I, I, three and four are pretty closely related. I think, I think you can't really ask about the direct fit without asking whether it's narrowly tailored. I think those are basically the same question. And in fact, when I taught many of you common law two, or yeah, common law two, the fit and the tailoring were the, were, the, were the same question. They're one and the same. Very good question. Thank you. I'm sorry? I was going to say, I don't see an immediate connection between advertising and I, I don't see it either. It, it's, pretty, it's pretty thin. I don't see that. It's, it's pretty far apart, I should say. Right, anything else in Central Hudson? Yeah, Colby. So if they had regulated this, like some states regulate water, it would have passed. Or what about these water shortages where you're only allowed to use water for a certain period of time? If New York had created a statute where they were only allowed to, use, like what she said, use electricity during a certain period of time, that would have That'd be fine, but they can't ban you from speaking about it. Okay. Right? I think this is David's question a minute ago, right? They can tell you you can't use water at certain times of the, of the month if it's a drought, but they can't prevent you from talking about what, when you're using water. Right? It, it's strange. They have the greater power to regulate your use of water, but they lack the lesser power for you to talk about your use of water. Everyone just get my get, get what I'm saying, right? They can regulate what you're doing, but not what you're saying, which is a much better, you don't have water, right? You're thirsty, but they, you can't talk about it, right? You can, you can, you can, in other words, you can complain about not having water, but you can't have the water yourself. Okay. That makes sense? So, yeah. So follow up with, I know I see these on TV in Texas, like, oh, free nights and weekends. Would that be a different way, like, if New York wanted to say, you can't say free nights and weekends because this is actually making us... Would that be a time, place, and manner restriction, right? Yes. So in the, in the Virginia case, it said you can regulate the time, place, and manner of commercial speech. There, it's not a ban on advertising. It's just regulating the manner which you convey information. I think that'd be, that'd be an easier call, so time, place, and manner restriction. One reason why I like these cases is it actually is a much easier application of scrutiny, right? Usually scrutiny is like, you know, affirmative action and, you know, excluding women from, you know, military institutions, right? These are very emotional issues. I think students can get into this a little bit easier because no one really cares, right? It, it, it doesn't have the same sort of political juice that like, you know, abortion or something else. This is much easier. So you can actually assess how narrowly tailored is this restriction, right? Is there actually a direct link or is it more attenuated? So. I've never actually taught this case before, but it actually worked out than I thought. Okay, good. Usually skip this in First Amendment, or con law, too. All right, anything else in Virginia? Okay. Let's move on. Uh, but, 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 who, who am I up to? I think, I think McKinney's next. Okay. All right, so the next case is much more recent, 2001. Lori Lar Tobacco versus Riley uh, with Justice O'Connor in the majority opinion. So before I call on you, does anyone remember when there were actually like commercials for like tobacco yeah. in public? Does anyone remember cigarette vending machines? Yeah. Yeah. Did they have them in Texas? Do they still exist? Yeah, they're still in bars. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is it in a bar only? Yeah, well, there's somewhere that's age restricted already. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, when I used to grow up in New York, they were everywhere. And there were these machines and you pull the thing and then you, you know, a pack of cigarettes would come out. They just don't exist anymore. You know, when you went to a Yankees game, there'd be a huge billboard in center field for Marlboro, right? There'd just be a huge billboard. Um, that just doesn't exist anymore. You don't see it anywhere. Basically, the industry's been driven out of, out of, the, out of the public square, uh, part because of cases like this, perhaps. Yeah, Kyle? Just an anecdote. In Mexico, they're required to put like, these big, ugly pictures of like, really cancerous lungs and stuff like that. Yeah. But People buy it anyway. Like, very yeah, yeah. If you ever buy a foreign pack of cigarettes, they have these basically commercials, these photographs of like, of like cancerous lungs and like, you know, dirty, disgusting teeth. You've seen those? Yeah. If you ever like the duty free at the airport, you see them all the time. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, um, in regards, I know uh, tobacco companies used to do a lot of advertising and like auto racing. 
Yeah, yeah, the Winston Cup, right? Yeah. In one, specifically in Formula One, um, Mark is a huge sponsor of the Ferrari team. But when they come to the U.S. Grand Prix, they get a smaller logo just for the U.S. Grand Prix. And I remember last year, it actually caused a little bit of a, like a little stir in the reporters about it, but it's in the, or they'll use like a, or they, and they also use like an, an alternative one that mm. is one of their e-cigarette brands. Oh, Juul or something, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a huge thing with the, 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 the vaping now. That, that, that's a huge issue right now, whether it can be banned for minors, but beyond my scope. Okay, uh, Bikini, you want to run me through the facts. What did, what did Massachusetts do here? They, they, they did a few different things here. So they were regulating uh, tobacco commercials in the outdoor and indoor. Okay, good. So I want to discuss them separately. So first, let's do the outdoor, right? McKinney, what, was the, um, what were the outdoor regulations that they had uh, in Massachusetts? So I was pretty sure they didn't want it near like school zones or- How far like, away? They wanted it, um, I don't remember the exact number, but they didn't want it near school zones. They, didn't, they wanted it like to keep it in the inner cities and then keep the billboards at a certain time. Right, right. So the, the cigarette, the law prohibited banning, I'm sorry, the law banned outdoor advertisement of cigarettes within a thousand feet of a school or playground. Um, you often see in law, where the government says you can't have this within a thousand feet of a school or a playground. Let, let, me, let, me, let me tell you a story. When I was clerking in Western, I think I told you this in property actually. Uh, when I was clerking in Western Pennsylvania, uh, a nearby town wanted to open up a methadone clinic. You know what that is? It's basically a treatment for opiate addiction, right? It's, it's, a, it's a synthetic product, helps people with addiction. This was, this was before the, method, the opiate thing blew up. This was in the early you know, 2000s. Um, so a group wants to open up a clinic inside this town in Pennsylvania. And the town flips out, say, no, you can't open it here, right? And uh, finally, they, they pass a law saying that, you know, you can't build a methadone clinic within 1,000 feet of a school or a park or a playground, right? Okay, so they actually find something out in the industrial park, right, town. It's not near any school. It's not near any playground. This is in a small town, Pennsylvania, but it's all the way out in the, in the, in the sticks, right? You know what the city does? There was a little strip of grass in front of the clinic. They designated that a park. <laughs> so they couldn't open up the clinic. So whenever you see you can't live within a thousand feet, it's basically, an, it's, it's, a, it's basically a closet ban. In fact, there are some states that have sex offender laws say that if you're a sex offender, you can't live within a thousand feet of a school or, or a park, which sounds great. Yeah, we don't have people living near these things. Well, first of all, they can walk near the school, right? It's stupid, but they just can't live there. But the upshot is they can't live anywhere, right? In Miami, you have these sex offenders living under bridges because it's the only place on the highway not near a school or a park or, or church, whatever else. These are basically de facto bans on existence, right? They can, they can live under the bridge, basically. That's all they can live. So I think the numbers in this case reflect it, that basically in Massachusetts, 90-something percent of the area you can't have any advertisements in. And indeed, with the outdoor bans, if you have a display in your window and it can be seen outside, that's an outdoor ban. So it's not even just billboard. It's actually like any visual thing anywhere in the state of Massachusetts, or at least in the big cities. Okay? That's the outdoor policy. Nathan, what about the indoor policy? This one's a little bit funny. This one, yeah, it's, it, I, I chuckle when I read it every time. It, so it referred to like, you know, posters that you see on like walls and stuff, something like that. And they had to be placed uh -huh. yeah. five feet, yeah, at least five yeah. feet. Yeah, yeah uh, something like that. Up above so kids could look at them at high level. <laughs> like this? <laughs> John, you're shaking your head. I about that, but supermarkets pay millions just for that kind of placement and to put things there. Yeah. So there is actually a psychology behind it. So I that... actually agreed with that one. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well. Like Hunt's Ketchup pays millions for H-E-B to put it on that shelf. And not Heinz. And not any higher or any lower. That kind of, it goes in. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'll, I'll take the friendly amendment. Yeah, Kyle. So I just want to put their counterpoint. Like, <laughs> was there any cigarette company that was, like, pushing to have their advertisements at knee level? Like, <laughs> what was the point of that? They went as far as to put a cartoon camel on the cigarettes just to induce children. So I don't think that they did not think about that. People remember candy cigarettes? Remember those? Yes. Yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Those were good. You was okay. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was bubble gum, right? And then you blow those chalk or whatever. 
Anyway, so they ban basically any sort of um, display, was it below, I guess it has to be above five feet. The idea is so it's not at the child's eye line. Uh, they also banned basically selling products where there's no clerk, right? They want the tobacco to be behind some sort of counter, right? Uh, in other words, the self-service kiosks are not permitted, I guess, unless... No, I, I think Massachusetts are banned altogether. I don't think you can have them at all. Maybe in Texas with a bar, but... Yeah, they, they said they were banned there, so only you could... You had to interact with the sales clerk. Yeah, so I think, you, you know, the self-service kiosks, would, wouldn't, wouldn't, the vending machines would not work. Okay, so you have these outdoor restrictions and you have the point of sale restrictions. And both these are reviewed with the commercial speech doctrine. Um, why? They're restricting, they're restricting what, right? No, why, why is this even a commercial speech issue, right? I get the billboard, I get that. But s selling tobacco, right? They're just regulating whether a clerk has to be present when tobacco is being sold, why is that even speech? Isn't it, isn't it just the sale of an item? But it's economic. Oh, it is economic, but but why is this commercial speech doctrine even relevant here? Now let me ask the question this way, right? This law effectively bans um, self-service vending machines for tobacco, right? Does that violate the First Amendment? No, John, what do you think? They answer it on the bottom of 15, 17. They said that they're... Um... Or let me ask a question for you. Does it implicate the First Amendment? No, but they tried to say that. Okay, but why... Okay, what's the argument that does implicate the First Amendment? That it does? Yeah. Uh... Think about it for a second. Oh, each brand is cigar is unique and customer is sought to handle that. The little vending machines convey information, right? The vending machines that sell the tobacco convey information. Price... Branding, colors. That's, of course, not the reason why those machines exist, right? Those machines don't primarily exist to tell you about the most recent brand of cigarettes. They exist to sell you a damn pack of cigarettes. But the tobacco companies argued that those devices convey information, they convey truthful information, and therefore, this law prohibits them from sharing truthful information, just like the power company and just like the pharmaceuticals. Now, the court rejected the argument, I get it, but I want you to understand why they made the argument in the first place. Okay, everyone with me? All right, Kelly, so let's start with the out outdoor ban. Walk me through the court's analysis for the outdoor ban. And everything's factors, basically three and four. Factors one and two are stupid. They just, they, they, don't, they don't really matter. The outdoor ban. Well, Kelly, let me ask the question like this, right? This, this goes back to Goldie's question a few minutes ago. Is there a link between banning advertisement of tobacco and, and children using tobacco? Yes. Yeah, there's a link. I don't know if it's direct, but there's at least some problem of underage minors using, uh, by the way, smokeless tobacco is basically chewing tobacco. They, you know, like, that's what it is, what the, what the ball players use, right? Oh, by the way, I, I got the most random call a few weeks ago from a member of the Houston uh, City Council that the city was considering a bill that would have banned the using of smoke, smoke of tobaccos by employees of a professional baseball team in Houston, which would basically be the Houston Astros and the visiting team. No, it said uh, minor league. No, it said major league baseball. Well, all the minor leagues but it's, the it's for their insurance. But what's weird is like cities have done it just in general. Yes, but this law only applied. The bill got killed because Major League Baseball flipped out, okay. right? Because it conflicts with the collective bargaining. But this law only applied to employees of Major League Baseball teams, even in their staff and like their you know people working the ballpark for you know concessions, whatever. I'm just wondering why they wouldn't say for any government property. But because they only want to ban it for baseball. What would they 
he, he called me to ask if this law is unconstitutional. I said, wow, that's, you know, it's a classification based on employment for a baseball team. It's kind of weird. I didn't think it was unconstitutional. I told him I don't think there's a problem with it. It's a weird law. But the law got killed because Major League Baseball intervened. They said this is not going to happen. There's a lot of the cities that have that. And so like San Francisco a Giants general ban might be permissible, but this was targeted at one class of employees. Yeah, it was really weird. There was one person on the city council who was very much uh, 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 focused on smokeless tobacco, which is like you know, chewing tobacco. He probably chewed, and that's why he didn't want to do it. I don't know. Okay. Anyway, but the court says it's factors three satisfied. There's enough of a link. But the fourth factor, JC, tell me about the fourth factor of the outdoor ban. It's a no-go. No-go, good. Why no? Why no-go? It is far too broad. Far too broad, yeah. T tell me more. Uh, oh. <laughs> Basically, he couldn't prove that it was narrowly tailored. Bingo. Bingo. That's the key, right? The fourth factor is asking about how, how narrow is it tailored. And this is a really, be be a really broad ban. Not broad band, but a broad ban, right? It, it, it sweeps in a lot of communications in virtually every corner of the city. It prohibits a substantial portion of major metropolitan areas. And also it bans advertisements that might be viewed from inside a store window. So imagine like, you know, you have a 7-Eleven or something with a, with a glass storefront and there's like a display of tobacco at six feet inside the store you're complying with the first part of the law. Someone sees that from outside the window. Now it's prohibited. The court says this goes way too far. It's a near complete ban. There's a lack of tailoring. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the range of communication is unduly broad. Now, uh, yeah. So, uh, 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 Gerard, what was it? Gerald, oh, I was one letter off. Gerald, you're just, just you're testing me now. Gerald, uh, one letter off. I have a friend named, I, I have a friend named Gerard. Um, one less thing to think about. What was that? We like that better. We like that better. Gerard? Gerard, yeah. head out of the, Sorry, Gerard. And his name's Ivan McKinney, that's his last name. I was calling him that for the entire semester and I figured it out. Anyway, so Gerald, um, what might be a more narrow, a more narrowly tailored version of this law that Massachusetts could enact, that if you want to um, advertise tobacco outside, what might be a more narrowly tailored version of what the, what the state could mandate? Probably limiting the area in which you would ban the advertisement. The problem here was, because it was so broad, you could so have it. So what would be a more narrowly tailored approach? Give me an example. Um, maybe limiting. I mean, I guess limiting advertisements to just maybe like stores within a few feet or maybe just inside the actual location where you would. Okay, so don't do an outdoor ban, only indoor ban. Right. All right. Cameron, think, what's another way, perhaps a more narrowly tailored way of, of going about this? Um, you can deal with what kind of advertising is used. Um, Ooh, what do you mean? Because they're talking about how... Well, we're trying to protect underage people from smoking, but the advertising for someone calls to be for someone who legally can purchase it. But, so how do you how do you target ads not at kids? Um, well, the people targeting kids will probably always be ahead of the game on this, but dealing with stuff like it was, you know the cartoon mascot would be something. Could that okay, would, I was waiting for you to say that. Could you ban cartoon mascots? Would that be worse or better? Would that be more or less narrowly tailored? I, I don't know. I was waiting for someone to say that. That's content-based. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think Kyle, oh, you're next, perfect. Yeah, Kyle, I think that's a content-based restriction. I don't think that would fly. But Kyle, what would be perhaps a permissible way of, of preventing kids from seeing these commercials? We can do time, place, and... Bingo, time, place, and manner. So what would, for example, a time, place, and manner restriction look like for billboards, right? You can't, like, say, billboard goes up at 5 p.m. and comes yeah. down at night, you, you know. You have to cover it during the day. I don't know. Yeah, um, you can't do it for a billboard. Yeah. And they already have a place restriction, right? So I, I feel like it's pretty narrowly tailored as far as the 1,000 feet. Yeah. Although they were talking about they could differ it based on whether it's urban, suburban, or rural. So I guess. Maybe in cities, one rural. Yeah, and, exactly. Like, huh? if it's out in the fields, that 1,000 foot restriction is Fine. pretty reasonable. Yeah. But at downtown Boston, for example, that's Possible. everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Andrew? I was just going to say, like, the way they talked about how the 
it was like 87 and 91 percent of the uh, the area where there was a ban on the advertisement i was just thinking well, why not if it was just like direct line of sight yeah. from a school or a something ah like so maybe 50 feet i mean really how far away can you see a billboard Right, I mean, how good are your eyes? I haven't really measured this. Maybe psychology tells you, but how far away can you see a billboard when you're driving down the road? What's the delta till I can see Bucky's is 50 miles away? Right? You know, how, how close do we have to get to see the billboard? You don't have to see it if you have the right image. Marble, I mean, the right image. Oh, yeah, the brand, you're saying such an iconic brand. Well, I have an idea. I mean, this is what I was thinking of. What if you just ban it at sporting events, right? Fenway Park, you can't have any uh, tobacco ads in the, in the stadium. Or you can't ban it you, or you say that you know you can't have advertisements at you know high school athletic fields. They, they used to sponsor sports teams, mm -hmm. right? And would that be more narrowly tailored location, uh, narrowly, narrowly tailored place restriction? Uh, the manner one I think is tough. Bang the cartoons. I, I, that same thought occurs to me. I don't think that would fly. You know, the bang of the Joe Camel. I, I think that'd be content based. Yeah, Nathan. Could they just ban just billboards and say you can only have? Oh man, uh, there, are, this size there are a lot of cases involving billboards, so many cases involving billboards. There's one case cited, I don't know how to sign it. Take you in property, Reed versus Town of Gilbert, or Town of Reed versus Gilbert, anyone have that in property with me? It, this, the, the town of, either Town of Reed or the Town of Gilbert, one of those, I forget which was which, uh, this town banned directional signs. They said that if you, no, they said if you have a, um, uh, if you have a sign promoting a political event, it could be this size, but a sign for direction has to be this size. And the court said you can't do that, or you can't restrict the size of manner of sign based on their content. Now, if the city said no billboards altogether, that I think would be over-inclusive because it prevents people from sharing information about politics, right? You want to have a vote for X or vote against Y. There's, a, there's so many cases about signs. It's, it's insane. It, it, before computers, billboards were an effective means of sharing information. Now it's like, who cares? Right? It doesn't really matter anymore, but this was a huge deal. All right, so anyone else on the outdoor ban? We'll go to the indoor ban in a minute. Okay. Je uh, Jessica, you want to walk me through the indoor restrictions for Massachusetts? The point of, what they call the point of sale, POS, not that POS, but point of sale advertising for smokeless tobacco. Yeah, they did the outdoor first, and then they did the indoor second. Okay, that's fine. Jesse? Um, it talks about that it restricts the indoor advertising use that not only needs to go to five feet. Um, it concluded that it failed both the three and four of the Hudson tests because not all children are five feet. They did not look up at the advertising. Yeah. Um, Jesse, let me ask you a question, right? Why is this? Why is the sale of tobacco not conduct? Like, isn't selling tobacco conduct and at most wouldn't be governed by O'Brien? I guess you can say you're, you're selling cigarettes to try and convey information about why smoking is awesome, I guess. I don't know. But isn't the act of selling conduct that warrants the O'Brien test? Good. But, but I want to just go back to Justice Breyer and NIFLA. This is a regulation of economics. It's saying you can't sell tobacco without a clerk present. They say, aha, we're not challenging the ban on the, sailing, or the selling. We're challenging the ban on conveying information without a clerk, right? We want to put up a sign next to our kiosk saying, here's the tobacco, it's awesome, and you're not letting us share this information. Depending how you frame the challenge, it's either a 14th Amendment due process challenge, which you're going to lose on, or the central Hudson Intermediate Scrutiny, which you have a chance of winning on, as I do here. This is why Breyer is so irate. Okay? I don't think Rank was dissent in this one, so we can check on that. I think he would make peace with it, I guess. I don't know. All right, so Jessica, uh, so now walk me through why uh, the indoor one fails the third and fourth factors, please. Start with the, start with the easiest one, right? The five-foot rule, right? Why, why is the five-foot rule uh, not, not good? Yeah. There's some tall kids, right? I mean, I, I'm sure you remember when you were in elementary school, kids were up to five feet already, right? In other words, they're applying pretty, 
I don't want to say strict screening, it's pretty narrow tailoring, right? I think you could say it's a general matter. Most people under five feet tall are also under the age of 18. Not always. It's a stereotype based on height, if you will. But usually, I, I think I even use height in class as an example of a non-suspect classification, because we all grow up, or not everyone. But here they're saying that the law is not precise enough, that, that they're not actually accomplishing what they set to accomplish. Kyle. I just thought of this. This would actually, uh, the, this means is so broad that it would sweep up my stepmom. She's under <laughs> four, nine, I think. So she would actually have to look up. Oh, boy. Yeah. Like the kids, or some of the kids, right? Yeah. So like my kids. nephew's almost six foot. I mean, also you have people in wheelchairs and other disabilities who, who aren't. So yeah, I mean, the law is pretty, you know, it's pretty broad, right? But maybe John's right. Maybe psychologically having the, the tobacco to eye level actually makes a huge difference. But the court says, no, no, we need something a little bit more precise. So the five-foot rule, they say, is not enough. So the, And ultimately they say the court, I'm sorry, the state has demonstrated... Um, an interest in protecting minors from tobacco, but this is not narrowly tailored enough, and it flunks the third and fourth factors of O'Brien. They're really, they're the same. I mean, they overlap so heavily, the third and fourth factors. I, I don't like multi-factor balancing tests, because usually there's one factor that the entire case turns on, and so it's really a one-factor balancing test. It, it doesn't really matter. I, I remember once I was clerking at this case, with the court actually, there's, there are eight factors to balance. And at that point, there's no actual test. It's just, it's completely arbitrary. There, and Justice Breyer, Lord help him, bless his heart, he, he loves balancing factors. He loves balancing tests. And he has like these six or seven factor balancing tests that are basically worthless. Um, he wrote one case called Comstock. And he also wrote um, Holman's Health, which he wrote in the abortion uh, context last year with these, you know, these, here are eight or nine factors to consider, uh, which are utterly unhelpful. I, my one hope for Justice Breyer is he doesn't write any more common law decisions. He, just, he <laughs> makes my job much more difficult. There are, the other ones are fine, but just, he's bad. Okay. Anything else in the majority in um, Laurie Lard, tobacco? Okay. Justice Scalia, I'm sorry, Justice Kennedy and Scalia concurred in part, and he says that, you know, we don't need to decide factor three because factor four is so easy. And they also express some misgivings about Central Hudson. Right? They don't quite say we got to get rid of it, but they're, you know, saying this is kind of weird, right? This test is kind of stupid. We don't like it. Then we got uh, Wit, I think, go back up top. Did I skip that back? Oh, no, I, okay, you guys are next. But okay, so, so Wit for you for next. Justice Thomas, as usual, is saying burn it all down, right? <laughs> what does he want to burn down today? Oh, that was such a good setup. Uh, oh, you kill my kill my flow. Yeah, so <laughs> burn it all down. It doesn't really even. It also fails like even intermediate scrutiny of uh, No, no, Justice Thomas. What's what's Thomas's point? Wit. I'll come back to you, Colby. What's Thomas's point? said strict scrutiny is appropriate regardless of whether it could be the speech itself could be yeah. commercial. Yeah. Justice Thomas would abolish any distinction between commercial and non-commercial speech. He would apply strict scrutiny to everything. Again, burn it all down, right? He would get rid of the entire edifice of the commercial speech structure. He says there's no difference between sharing information about a political candidate and sharing information at the price of a, of a particular good. But he makes a point saying that the government always wants to restrict speech because things are dangerous, right? That people might be inspired by totalitarian dogmas and subvert the republic. That they'll be inflamed by racial demagoguery and embrace hatred and bigotry. Or they'll be enticed by cigarette advertising and choose to smoke. You know, one of these things is not like the other, perhaps. But this, 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 is, this is standard Thomas Fair. He says that the government can't stop us from hearing from hearing harmful information, and all information should be reviewed with strict scrutiny. Okay. So I'll just pause here and note, Thomas wrote the majority opinion in NIFLA. He didn't mention commercial speech at all. Like, it didn't come up. And some of you probably noticed that. So the guy who basically said we need to get rid of it in the Lori Lard case about 15 years later says, we're just not going to talk about it. 
he didn't have the votes to overrule it. If you notice, it was a five-member majority and a four-member concurrence. <laughs> this is just one thing with Justice Thomas. He does not get many 5-4 cases. He'll get more now because he's actually pretty senior. Uh, he's had a few. But he's very bad at holding majority together because he likes going his own way. Right? Usually, the, to hold a majority opinion, you have to sort of make compromises. And just Thomas doesn't do that. So basically, I think what happens, Chief Justice Roberts gave this to Thomas. And he wrote this broad opinion. They're like, whoa, not that far, buddy. So Kennedy wrote this concurring opinion in which they all joined. So basically, everyone joined it but Thomas. So anyway, that, just Justice Thomas does not get many 5-4s because he, he likes going his own way. Yeah, I've counted. I think there's one or two in your book. Um, uh, he's now the second most senior justice after Roberts. So if Roberts is ever not in the majority, that means Thomas gets to assign it, um, which means he can either give it to himself or give it to someone else. So in theory, Thomas might give himself some more 5 fours because Kennedy's gone. Kennedy was more senior than was Thomas. But it just very few 5-4 opinions in the book. I can't think of... Shoot. I mean, you guys have me for con law. I don't Are there any other Thomas opinions in the book? I mean, dissents, plenty. Uh, there, there are a hell of a lot of Thomas dissents, but majority opinions? You wrote an ERISA case. Oh, my goodness. That was studied in wills. Oh, boy. Lord help you. Yeah. Well, but that, that's exactly right. Thomas gets the boring crap, right? The, I'm sorry. The, 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 the boring ERISA cases. Funny, no, this is actually a true story. I put this in my book. When, um, uh, when, when a new justice comes on the court, Oh, I want to make sure I get the story right. When a new justice comes on the court, um, they always assign them an easy 9-0 unanimous opinion. And the reason why is to make their entry you know, pleasant, right? They don't have to deal with any dissents or anything. Um, so usually it's a boring case, right? Something's going to be 9-0. Um, when Justice Ginsburg came on the court, um, the first case she got was an ERISA case. Oh, let me get you this quote, right? When Ginsburg first came to court in 93, she awaited her first opinion assignment. And Chief Justice Rehnquist gave her an ERISA case. Okay? And apparently Justice O'Connor gave her advice. She said, you know, I understand it's tedious, but you have to get the job done. And the reason why is if you get the job done, the tedious cases, they'll assign you better cases in the future. So unfortunately, the Thomas clerks they basically write ERISA majority opinions and fascinating originalist dissents. That's basically what they're hired to do. Yeah, Joe. That was that was concurring opinion. It was not controlling. Well, it was a four one four, but he did not write the majority. It was a, it was a concurring opinion. Yeah, just not many Thomas opinions in the book. I mean, there are a lot of dissents, but just not majorities. That's not his thing. He's he's playing the long game, as they say. Anything else on, uh, oh, I skipped around. Anything else on, um, on the Lori Lard case? All right, wait, I'll come back to you. We already did Metal v. Tan. Oh, okay. So, you just kind of remember, but wasn't it back in the 90s, and early 2000s, maybe kind of like the cigarette was kind of big, and then. Yeah. So, what I was thinking is, even though they had all these advertisements, you could still see them to eat them, right? Yeah, you don't have that anymore. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of groups have pressured Hollywood to remove tobacco from films. So you just don't see it. And in fact, there are actually laws. If you ever notice a beer commercial, there is holding the beer but never drinking it. The prohibition is actually they can't consume it on a film. They can hold the cup, but they can't like tip it into their mouth. It's like a weird thing, but they can't actually drink. So they're always holding cups of beer and they're actually drinking it. I was going to say cigarettes are automatic. Someone smoking cigarettes is an automatic are. PG-13. Is it PG-13? Yeah. Yeah. But those restrictions may force them to be more creative, like the Budweiser commercials and other tobacco and alcohol commercials are pretty creative. I don't know if they would be so creative without such. Yeah, I guess you go for the Marvel Man, but I mean, but, but you you don't see tobacco commercials very often anywhere. I don't even know. I, I when's the last time you saw a commercial for cigarettes? I can't even think of one. No, I, yeah, I mean the little propaganda for kids, right? But. I, I can't think of anything. They were in the magazines pretty prevalent. Mm -hmm. 
I was going to say the very first episode of Mad Men, and they're oh. talking, it's advertising cigarettes, mm-hmm. and they're like having this big debacle in the conference room at the beginning of the episode about how do we continue to advertise given regulations and health issues and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anything else? All right. Wait. So we already did Metal v. Tam, right? We already did this case. This was involving the slants. And you recall the slants were this Asian American rock band, and they wanted a trademark with their name, the slants, in it. So there was a brief part of the case. I only give you a little, little chunk of it, but whether trademark was commercial speech. Wait, walk me through Justice Alito's analysis. Excuse me, Alito's analysis, please. Well, well, the, the government's, which, which factor Central Hudson is actually being considered here? The leader doesn't actually say it, but which factor are they talking about? No, he says that it doesn't, um, the restriction doesn't serve a substantial interest. In ah, so that's the, that's the second factor. So it doesn't really matter, right? They're really strict here. Um, I think by focusing on factor number two, uh, he's basically second guessing uh, what, what's a substantial interest, right? So what are the interests the government puts forward uh, with in this case? Um, so the government asserts two interests. And um, what the first was preventing underrepresented groups from bombarded with demeaning messages. And Good. Government. Right. So you recall in uh, Mattel, the court held that um, they can't ban speech because it might be offensive. And here they're saying that that's not a valid state interest. Is, that, is it substantial to keep people from hearing offensive messages? That strikes me as a different question of whether it's unconstitutional. I think, the, I think Alito sort of conflates the two, whether there's an interest in keeping people from offensive messages, whether they can actually ban these messages. That's, that's the first one. Um, the second was whether there's a, was an orderly flow of commerce. And that's sort of, the court, Alito just dumps that one away. So, my, what I'm trying to get is the court sort of just breezes past Central Hudson. They don't really talk about the tailoring at all. It's enough that there's a, there's a viewpoint based, uh, I'm sorry, a content based description of discrimination. Yeah. I just saw a parallel in this case and when the government is regulating uh, commerce and using the kind of race relations and to- the you know, spreading of tolerance. Uh, mm-hmm as something of, that affects the economy, and mm-hmm. that seems to get like past constitutional muster, but with the First Amendment. Yeah, th- again, strong. this is Rehnquist, this is broad. Frame and economic regulation is a matter of speech. You get into either strict or intermediate scrutiny. If it's a regular economic regulation, it's not speech, you're at rational basis, worldly optical. So depending how you frame your challenge, you reach very different results. Um, Justice Kennedy also sort of mused about this, talking about viewpoint discrimination. Uh, and then you have Justice Thomas saying, hey, you guys, remember me? We got to overturn all this stuff. Burn it all down. Burn it down. Yeah, uh, JC. Was Kennedy's uh, concurrence, to me, it seemed like we shouldn't still be differentiating between uh, regular First Amendment speech and commercial speech? <sighs> you know, I, I read the excerpt from Kennedy about three times. I'm not really sure what he's saying. Um, he, it's a bad excerpt, and Randy edited this one. Um, like he, he makes fun of me in his class. I always cut stuff out. He always, I talk to his students, like, he talks about you that you cut stuff out of his book, so I'm going to do it to him. I, I didn't edit this one. He did, and I don't think there's enough context there to fully understand. I have to go back and read the full case. But I don't, something of viewpoint. K- Kenny's very wishy anyway. It doesn't matter what he thinks anymore. <laughs> I said that on Twitter that people were jumping on me. I actually got a former Kennedy clerk emailing saying, yes, it still matters what Kennedy says. Okay. It doesn't matter. Okay. All right. Let's take the last case. Uh, this was a recent case decided, oh my goodness, just, oh, oh, I was in the court the day this was decided. Um, just a f- funny story, but um, whenever the justices uh, deliver big opinions at the end of the year, their spouses should come in. So I was there in court today. I saw Ginny Thomas walk in. Oh, I guess Thomas has a majority opinion. And he had, he had this one. Uh, so that was, that's, that, that, that was the tell. Oh, did I tell you the story about Kennedy's family? 
So I was in the court on the last day of the term last year, the very last day of the term, uh, to hear arguments. And you know, about 15 minutes before the uh, session began, I see Justice Kennedy's wife walk in, and Justice Kennedy's son walks in, and Justice Kennedy's grandkids walk in. And I'm like, oh. And I was sitting in the front in the, uh, in the lawyer's section, and the press section's right to my left. So there was a reporter from a national publication, I won't say who, who that person is, and this reporter said, oh, fuck. Because <laughs> they all knew what that meant. Kennedy's entire family was coming, he was about to step down. Now, he didn't retire during the session. He played us for a loop, as he usually does. And he went to the White House afterwards, announced his resignation. But once I saw his family, I'm like, oh, his family's here, his entire mishpacha. The, the entire clan is here, right? And, uh, what? I didn't know what they looked like, his family. Oh, I know these things. <laughs> You have to know who has a majority opinion based on their family. Right? I know what Ginny Thomas looks like because I knew Thomas had an opinion. So I know what Joanna Breyer looks like and what Martha and Alita looks like and what Roberts' wife. I think her name is Jane Roberts. No, she has a Jane. I think she has a maiden name, Roberts, too. But I know what Jane Roberts looks like. Uh, Maureen Scalia. I know what she looked like. Maureen never came. She didn't care. Um, uh, Ginsburg's husband passed away some years ago, but I know what Marty looked like. Uh, you know, you, you know what they look like. Justice Breyer's wife is actually a member of the British aristocracy. She's actually some, she has some title of nobility or something or other. I don't remember exactly what it is, but some, some title of nobility. Okay. She's a psychologist. I, you know these things. It's, 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 a cult of, it's a cult, unfortunately. The cult of the Supreme Court. All right. Um, all right, Joseph, you want to give me the facts in uh, national... Institute of Family and Life Advocates versus Becerra, uh, or NIFLA for short. Just give me the facts, please. Uh, Okay, very good. Um, this law has a lot going on in the background. Um, are you guys familiar with the concept of the crisis pregnancy centers? Okay. Um, these are, and I'll try and describe these as neutrally as I can, uh, facilities that try to discourage and dissuade women from having abortions. And they try to give them options, adoption or otherwise, to help them carry the child to term and take care of the child or, or, or give it for adoption. Okay. That, that's what these, group, these groups do. Um, they are often advertised in a manner that, oh, how do I put this, isn't entirely transparent what they're doing, right? They'll be called pregnancy center, or these different names. And someone might walk in and think that it's a clinic that provides contraception or might provide abortion services. But they're not going to tell you about that. And they're going to try and encourage you to other things. Some of these facilities actually have medical doctors. Like they'll give you a sonogram for free, right? They'll do things to... You know, uh, you know, t take a diagnostic, whatever, right? Um, some of these centers are not licensed. They're just people hand out pamphlets and information. Um, the state didn't ban these centers. The state didn't ban the unlicensed centers. Instead, they put requirements about information they have to share. Now, we did a case that relates this before, right, about forcing you to publish information. Evan, what, what case or cases am I thinking about? Let's see if we can connect it. It's, it's actually cited in one of the, in the opinion here. Case that requires you to publish information against your will. Two cases I'm thinking of. Is it a newspaper case? Good. What's it called? Do you remember the name? Um, From Miami. 
Bingo. Miami Herald versus Tornillo, right? This was the right of reply that if you criticize the government official, you have to give the official right of response. It's that the government made you publish information that maybe you didn't want to publish. Um, was it the entertainment commercial that they mentioned? No, no, no. Well, I guess publish, pu publish ratings. I guess that, that might be one. Katie, think of another one? Red line. Red line. Doctrine, right? That you're obligated to post um, equal time, right? Equal, equal side, fair and balanced news, as it were. Okay? So we've already done cases, right? In Red Line, they said you can force someone who has spectrum to publish the response. But with a newspaper, you can't, right? Because the newspaper, there's only so much column space. And forcing someone to convey a message is making them change their their content. So in some regards, this case is similar to um, uh, the uh, Miami Herald versus Tornillo, right? You're forcing the licensed facilities to publish these signs in their clinic, in the waiting room, in English, and 13 other languages. Um, and for the unlicensed clinics, they have to publish these signs. And in you need to disclose, uh, you know, what, what services they're providing and that California might have uh, free abortions provided, right? So in both cases, both the licensed and unlicensed, they're forcing these institutions to convey messages they don't want to convey. And by conveying these messages, it dilutes their other message, right? So let's say their messages don't have an abortion. By the way, the state provides free abortions. Now, is there a difference between the Miami Herald newspaper and these clinics? Right? And this isn't really discussed, but if you think about it, the newspapers are considered special, right? They're about promoting information, free speech, et cetera. But traditionally, doctors are heavily regulated. And we studied in con law Planned Parenthood versus Casey. This wasn't in your book. But one of the rules in Casey was whether you, the state could make abortion doctors hand out pamphlets about information about abortion, about adoption, whatever else. And the court said, yes, because if someone wants to get an abortion, you have to give them informed consent and give information about it. Here the court distinguishes those cases. And they say, well, that's not really relevant. Right? It's not really because the information they're making you disclose has nothing to do with the service they're providing. If this clinic wants to give information about adoption, you don't need informed consent about the risk of abortion and that the state might have free abortion elsewhere. So this case doesn't fit in perfectly with the Red Lion, Tornillo, Casey framework. And I think that Justice Breyer um, hammers this point home, I think, fairly effectively. Uh, I see the NIFLA case as uh, shifting a new direction in the Supreme Court with regards to commercial speech. Um, I don't know how much juice Central Hudson has left, pun intended, right? I, I, don't, know, I don't know what its vitality is. Um, this should have been a perfect case about commercial speech, and, and it wasn't. It just didn't, didn't, didn't factor in. All right, so Katie, let's just walk through the majority opinion. Um, the lower court, the Ninth Circuit, said that, quote, professional speech should be entitled to more deferential scrutiny. What is professional speech? Good. And then they said that for lesser protection, it uh, would be for professional speech in like two situations. So it was oh, I'll get to those in a minute, but thank you. Yeah. So first off, the court says the mere fact that someone engages in speech when they're in a regulated profession doesn't mean they get reduced scrutiny. Right? The mere fact that you engage in speech in a regulated profession doesn't mean it's unprotected or less protected. So this is basically Thomas saying strict scrutiny all the way down. Okay? Now there are two examples, or there are two exceptions, I want to mention these briefly, where uh, professional speech might give rise to um, 
a more relaxed scrutiny. The first one is a case called Zauderer. Oh, God, I can never say it. Zauderer. Z-A-U-D-E-R-E-R. -E -E Zauderer. I always say that wrong. Where it says Office of Disciplinary Counsel of the Supreme Court of Ohio. And this case, there was a rule for lawyers. And it said that lawyers who advertise on a contingency fee basis, you know what that is, right? That you only pay if you get paid, right? And if there's no payout, you don't pay anything. Well, there's sometimes fees and costs involved. And they say if you disclose contingency, you have to say that you might have to pay some fees and costs. And the Supreme Court in that case said, well, that's fine, right? Because it doesn't relate to, uh, I'm sorry, it, it, it's connected to the um, uh, uh, disclosure of factual information about provision of legal services. Okay. Um, the second case involves Casey, which I mentioned earlier. Okay. So when the Supreme Court does, they say, well, we have these two cases that are very similar. But let me give you some distinctions, right? What they're doing is saying, we're not going to follow those cases anymore. We're going to limit those cases to their facts and ignore them. So Breyer makes this point, I think, fairly effectively. Um, Zouderer could very well have controlled this case. Casey could have very well controlled this case. But Thomas was not willing to give those cases the full breadth that they could be given, and he read them far more narrowly. Okay. I'm sorry, can you repeat that again? Yeah. So when they... let, me, let, me ask, let me say it differently, right? If the court wanted to uphold the law, they could have just cited Zouderer and Casey saying, look, this is very similar, right? This is speech disclosed in the context of a regulated profession. We'll give this intermediate scrutiny, and this is permissible. The majority wasn't ready to overrule those cases, mm -hmm. so they basically distinguished them away and limited them to facts. They said, well, Zatterer only concerns the disclosure of factual information, right, that relates to service being provided. If you're providing services for contingency, you have to disclose information about the contingency. Here, the notice does not relate to the services provided by the clinics. If a clinic is talking about adoption, telling them that there's free abortions near So they basically impose a germaneness requirement, a relatedness factor that was not in Zatterer. So I think Thomas amps up the, the level of scrutiny provided. And likewise, they draw a distinction with Casey. They say, ah, well in Casey, there's a disclosure because before you have an abortion, you need to have informed consent of what they're about to do. But here, there's no medical procedure, so you don't need this information. It's not relevant. Those discussions were not in Zatterer or Casey. This is what happens like when you're a lawyer and there's a precedent not on your side. What do you do? You distinguish it. You say, oh, here's a distinction. Now, the distinction might be pretty thin. And when you're a lawyer and you make a thin distinction, the court rejects it. When you have five votes, you can do that pretty easily. And they sort of just distinguished away Zatterer and um, Casey. Again, Thomas thinks strict scrutiny anyway doesn't really matter. That, that, that's his thing, which is why I think, again, he kind of lost the majority. He didn't lose it, but you know, basically the other, the other justices broke off. I mean, it's happened where Thomas has assigned the majority opinion, and he loses the majority and flips and goes the other way. It, there, there have been cases where he loses majority opinions. So, but but Th Thomas basically distinguishes away Zatterer and Casey. By the way, he talks about lawyers, right? He said the professional speech doctrine would cover a wide array of individuals, doctors, lawyers, nurses, physical therapists. Because of this case, because of this case, lawyers have brought many, many, many challenges across the country. So in some states, you have to become a member of the bar association to be a member of the bar, right? They're actually not necessarily the same thing, right? To practice law in a state, doesn't mean, you have to, doesn't mean you have to be a member of the Bar Association. And lawyers have said, making me become a member of the Bar is a form of compelled speech, and under NIFLA, I shouldn't have to do this. And now states are actually having the Bar's challenges unconstitutional. You still have to take the exam, but not the Bar Association. Texas, for example, you have to basically be a member of the Texas Bar Association, and uh, it's integrated, it's one, it's one element. Okay. Yeah, it, Kyle. I just, uh, there's a mandatory disclosure, right? If you're a bar member, you have to say, like, no. well, not all complaints are investigated by the bar. You can make a grievance, right? Right. That is a forced content-based speech. 
I think that would probably still be okay under Zatterer because it relates to the services provided. But beyond that, probably not. Okay. Uh, next, Justice Thomas talks about under-inclusiveness and over-inclusiveness. These are concepts that pop up over and over again, right? What does under-inclusive mean? The California law only applied to certain types of clinics. It didn't apply to clinics that provide contraception and abortion. It only provides these sort of crisis pregnancy centers. And Thomas hints saying the fact that it only applies to these clinics suggests that they were in fact trying to disfavor these viewpoints, right? The fact that only, it basically only applies to certain types of clinics, which are the crisis pregnancy, the crisis pregnancy centers. Okay. All right, so any questions on the licensed clinics? The unlicensed clinic one I think is actually a little bit easier, right? It requires all advertisements to be have uh, a message displayed on it in up to 13 languages, even billboards, right? You, you've seen billboards, right? You can't put a lot of words in a billboard. You put 13 languages on a billboard, it's not even practical. So I think this law fails, even Central Hudson, because uh, it's not narrowly tailored enough. This, this came up during the arguments. If there were some places with like a lot of different languages that would have to be published. Okay. So that was the, the, the unlicensed facilities. Yeah, Nathan. So just, I can't remember. Uh, did, <clears throat> was it only the dissent or did Thomas also talk about uh, viewpoint discrimination? That was the concurrence. I'll get there next. So Kennedy, Roberts, Alito, and Gorsuch wrote a concurring opinion. And they said, yeah, we agree with Thomas, bless his heart, right? But what we're really worried about here is viewpoint discrimination. And that these are pro-life pregnancy centers who are being compelled to disclose the state's pro-abortion pro -abortion, pro -abortion message. And the history of the law suggests that this was targeting people because of their beliefs about abortion. And so Kennedy's very, very upset about this. And he gets four votes almost five, but it's not. Thomas doesn't join him out of spite. Because where Thomas had joined that opinion, that would become the majority, because it's more narrow. It, it, it basically, right? What's a majority opinion? Does that have five votes? Is it the most narrow opinion that's a majority? So you often have these four vote concurrences that are pretty close to the majority. Okay, so any questions on the majority or Justice uh, Kennedy's concurring opinion? All right, let's go into Breyer. I, it's a long excerpt. I'm probably going to trim it for the future. Uh, but Breyer is very, very agitated here. I mean, he, 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 I saw him, dis he, he delivered this dissent from the bench. He was hopping. You know, Breyer is very, he's very sedate and very calm, but he was, he was annoyed. He was, he was pissed. He was pissed here. So Lance, walk me through Breyer. Walk me through the Breyer patch, if you will. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly right. Um, Breyer's worried that because of this decision, businesses will start challenging every manner of economic regulation under the guise of a free speech challenge. He's probably right. Um, if you, in fact, do give strict scrutiny, to all these sorts of content-based restrictions, then they're all, they're all gonna fall. For him, Casey governs this case. Zadaro governs this case. They might be right. Uh, Casey's First Amendment analysis was very thin. And if you remember, that was the sort of joint opinion with O'Connor, Kennedy, and Souter. It was this compromise. And I don't put a lot of weight in Casey's First Amendment analysis, but I think at least the court could have just said, we're not gonna follow this, and at least acknowledge this, rather than sort of crafting this argument, saying, well, Casey applies only when the informed consent applies to the abortion you're getting and not something related. That wasn't, that wasn't the basis of the case. And here, Justice Breyer repeats Lochner. Uh, he cites Williamson Bealey Optical. And he says, uh, courts should be careful to defer to regulation of the medical uh, profession. OK. Yeah, Cameron. Breyer cites, the first opinion he cites is his own. Yeah. 
Is that something that I don't see it? Which, well, which one was? Which one did he cite again? Uh, Reed versus Tanner Gilbert is concurring. Oh, oh, he cited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, Not he, the majority, but his, his own concurring. Yeah. Is that something? I suppose like you don't see that often. I wonder if there's. Uh, no, that no, not at all. No, Thomas cites his own dissents all the time. <laughs> yeah, I, I think what he's trying to show is I have complained about this before and I was wrong there, and I'm complaining about it again now. Well, Kennedy cites his majority opinions. He, Kennedy doesn't really have to concur. He, he's God, right? He just he writes his own con he writes his majority opinions, basically whatever he thinks. Yeah, he's like all the precedents that I wrote, right? You know, I think I had that same question last semester. Yeah. All, Kennedy would say, look at all these cases, which I wrote, <laughs> right? Uh, but yeah, it, I mean, Cameron, your, your question's well taken. Breyer has been dissenting on this point for almost a 15 years. He's just so many cases with the exact same point. He, he's not, even in the Schwarzenegger or the Brown versus EMA case, right? He's saying, we need to defer to the psychologists. If they think they know more about child psychi psychology, we'll defer to them, right? He's not willing to second guess their judgments. All right, where are we? So where does all this lead us? Um, I think the, the future trajectory of the court is they're gonna take a lot more free speech cases and the court is going to be using the First Amendment to set aside economic regulations. Uh, the day after NIFLA was decided, uh, the court decided a case called Janus, J-A-N-U-S. We'll be doing that in a few weeks, maybe next week, I can't remember. Is that next week? I can never remember. It's next week, it's a long case. And Justice Kagan argued in dissent that the conservatives were weaponizing the First Amendment, that they're using the First Amendment as a weapon against free speech. I'm sorry, as a, as a weapon against economic regulations. And so back to back, if NIFLA decided one day, and then Janice the next day might be off maybe two days later, but they're deciding in the same span, and Kagan was also hopping mad. And she cites Breyer invocation of Lochner in the Janice case. So just keep that in mind for next class. Questions? Thank you all. I will see you all next week. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much.